Last week on Fill in the Blanks, probably most people know you from presiding over the Dr. Larry Nasser case. He's the doctor, and I use that term loosely, who abused so many of the gymnasts. I allowed them to speak for seven days. He pled. And then the sentencing took seven days because that many women came forward. It's the backstory that really enlightens me on how best to sentence them. Did you say to him, I just signed your death warrant? I did. Do you regret saying that? I don't regret anything. I don't think there was any question that he had such breaks with reality that he didn't know the difference between right and wrong. He clearly showed no signs of remorse. The only signs of remorse that I saw were that no one believed him anymore and that he lost control. It just seems to me that he's probably safer in prison than he is on the street with a lot of fathers out on the street knowing what he did to their daughters. I think he would be in harm's way if he was walking around on the street. Agreed. And now more with Judge Rosemary Aquilina. I was really pleased that all of these women got an opportunity to speak out. It's interesting because I had a number of judges, literally from all over the world, but a, a lot from my community and, and others in Michigan and, and Texas and New York and all over America saying, I'm looking at what you're, you're doing and I'm going to do that. But I did have a few who said, you are an embarrassment and you should not be on the bench. And what was their point of view? Why? That was it. That I would get emails, text messages, messages on my phone. Um, there's no reason just that I was an embarrassment. Um, they were all men. No offense to the male population because there's a lot of good men out there. But there are a lot of male judges who, um, I guess, wanted to spend time on the golf course not listening. I mean, if you don't want to be a judge, don't be a judge. If you want to be a judge, listen to the people. Spend the time. So they were upset that you set the bar. And so now, if they don't let people speak, they're going to look bad by comparison? Yes. And the thing is, I've always done that. I didn't just do it for Nasser. I've always done it. The first day I took the bench, my clerk came over and said, they say you're spending too much time. I said, so? I get paid the same. Um, and, you know, sheriff wanted his people back. Attorneys wanted to go back to their offices and meet with clients. But I'm going to take as much time as it dictates depending on what's in front of me so I get the whole story so I make a good decision I sleep well at night you said in the beginning that the girls were mad at you and wanted you gone why because in the beginning of the case I was told by the lawyers that there were experts on both sides and I thought it was the cross between a criminal case and a medical malpractice case and I thought how interesting and then all the girls were out there talking well not all but very vocal girls were talking to the media. And I needed to get a clean jury for both sides. You have to have a fair and impartial jury for both sides. And I couldn't do that. It was very clear to me that if they kept talking, it was going to be very difficult to have a jury. And it was already going to be difficult. So I put a gag order and everyone was mad at me. And then I redid it and limited it a little bit more. But uh, I kept the gag order until sentencing. Because we needed a clean jury. Once he was going to plead, it didn't matter. But how do you get a jury? Where was it going to get a jury if the headline was always about Nasser? I'm curious about that. You know, having been the one that's tasked with making jury selections time and time again in concert with the lawyers, in really high profile cases. My experience has been gag orders always benefit the defendant, never benefit the plaintiffs who want to tell their story. The defendants never want the story told because they want to, you know, tamp down everything. And if it's a high profile case, then the story's out there. I mean, it's already in the news. It's already in the media. And the victim wants to tell their story. They find it cathartic to tell their story. If a judge puts a gag order on it and muzzles them, they always tell me they feel like 
I'm, I'm having my freedom of speech taken away. I'm a victim here, and now they're telling me I can't talk about it because it'll taint the jury pool. The story's already all over hell and half acre, and now I can't talk about it. And my belief was always that the test of an acceptable juror is not whether they've heard about the case or not but whether or not they can be fair and impartial and follow the judge's instructions, not whether they've heard the case. I mean, hell, they can be one of the party's cousin under the law if they can follow your instructions and set aside anything they may know about the case. They're an acceptable juror, correct? Correct. And I I follow your line, but here's mine. <laughs> okay. Right. So I, for Nassar, I had ordered 800 jurors and we had an extra set of jury instructions and all of that. There was a whole other process. And maybe we would have needed 2,000 jury uh, members to come in if I wouldn't have put the gag order. We'll never know. But let's think about the victim. I let the victim speak at the proper time, which is at the time of sentencing as many as want to, as long as they want to. And I think that should be the norm. If you let people speak ahead of time, all you're doing is giving the defendant who has a right to an appeal, if it's by jury, automatic right of appeal, an opportunity for more allegations. It was not a fair and impartial jury. And they can go through the transcript and find out exactly why and who was dismissed and why and what was said. And, of course, everybody's got a bias. Yes, we had to keep these people. They heard it. But they said they could be fair and impartial. But is that really true? And so now you've opened it up for the Court of Appeals, who's not in the courtroom, who didn't hear the evidence, because reading it and hearing it are two different things. And so the victims, aren't they re-victimized if the Court of Appeals says new trial? Or, oh, of course. Yeah. So let's do it on the front end, do it the right way, and then in the back end, give them all the time they need to testify. Mm-hmm. Change the Crime Victims' Rights Act to not just read victim, but victim is defined as anyone affected by the crime so that people who do what I did don't get victimized like me, <laughs> bullied like me, because I let everybody speak in their public courtroom. Broaden it. Give people their voice at the right time. You say you've been bullied on the bench. Absolutely. Who bullies you? You don't have to be yeah. name a name. So I, um, male judges have bullied me. Uh, female judges have bullied me. Uh, I have had two of the my best female judge friends have retired because of bullying. There are a number of female judges around uh, the country who have retired, a a few more in Michigan who I know who have retired or stepped down because they can't take the bullying. When I was pregnant with my twins, the chief judge called and said, so I hear you need a lot of time off. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I hear you're pregnant and need a lot of time off. I said, "Did, did you talk to my doctor? Do you know something I don't know? I said, I've never taken maternity leave off. When I had my middle child, I delivered her on a Thursday, and by Wednesday I was arguing a case in front of the Court of Appeals and won. So I don't know what you're talking about. And then he sort of, he backed off. But I was, you know, I've copied off bench books. Bench books, um, thankfully, the Michigan Judicial Institute has a lot of bench books, and they are 300 to 800 pages printed them off. I'm used to reading paper. I like to tab them, so I have them on the bench. Chief judge came and accused me of stealing paper. So I bought four boxes of paper and brought them in. He didn't bother to ask. I had my own printer, my own computer, and I bring in my own paper regardless. Another judge came in and accused me and said, well, you know, you're you're teaching and you're doing all these things, and, you know, they're going to say that you're, um, you know, not a good judge. And I said, well, did you know that the state court administrator's office knows that I'm teaching? Because two hours a week I was teaching um, either from like 8 to 10 or 9 to 11 or 3 to 5. But I don't take lunch hours. I said, why don't you check my key card and see how many hours I put in? I put in more than the 40 hours. No one was willing to do that. Why? And it, and it why are on. they doing this? I think because I'm outspoken, because when there's a problem, I speak up, because I speak up for the little guy, because I call them on their crap, and I don't really know. I 
I, I try to do the best job I can. I think they don't like that I'm in headlines. Many, you know, everybody's, like you said, familiar with Nasser, but I said no to the Detroit bankruptcy. I had the um, Dr. Mercer, who was, who's passed now, but allegedly killed his wife. I had Ricky Holland, who the adoptive parents uh, murdered him. I've had a lot of high profile cases. I've been in the media. The computer and God put me there. I did nothing to do that. Um, I do not believe in that's the way it's always been done. When you say that to me, I'm going to undo whatever it is that you've just told me because that tells me that we need to look under that carpet because something's wrong. And I'm always the one who says, we're not doing that today. In fact, my staff says, why is it always you who speaks up? Well, somebody has to. And I never worry about the consequence to me. They want to get me off the bench. I will go take other employment. I will always be employed. I have enough confidence in myself that I'm going to do the right thing and to hell with anybody else. I have to live with myself. And I'd rather be the voice than the silent one who is a co-conspirator to any crime or any negativity. You were the first female JAG officer. I was. And uh, my paperwork sat and sat, and I thought, well, it's because I'm naturalized. They had to do extra paperwork. And it was in part. And then I learned that my paperwork was completed and was sitting on a colonel's desk. So I guess I could have been a woman who says, oh, discrimination and all of that. But why? What I did was use my brains. I just said, I'm going to volunteer. So I volunteered, called up the colonel and said, I know the paperwork's there. Let me volunteer and get ahead of the game. I know you're busy doing a lot of court, court marshals and all that other. And he said, okay. So I showed up. I was a lot younger, thinner, and prettier then. And I showed up in the tightest jeans I could fit into, that, like Elvis painted jeans on, right? <laughs> got, got the picture. And my cowboy boots, because I've always been wearing cowboy boots. And a, a reasonable shirt. And I showed up, did my work. We were on the second floor of the building at that time. And about 10.30 is when everybody takes a little coffee break. So I went down knowing the general would be there and the colonels. And I just sort of sauntered in and took my time, hello. And I got my uh, muffin and my coffee. And by the time I made it upstairs again, the colonel had the phone in his hand pointing between me and the phone and him and I could hear the general screaming, who is that woman? Why is that woman here? And he said, she's going to be one of us. Her paperwork's been approved. And he says, well, where is the paperwork? He said, I think in the colonel's office next to you. And the general screamed, get that woman in a uniform. The very next weekend, I was sworn in. The rest of that story is they took the contract they took out six years and put eight. I said, sir, please put 20. I will stay my 20. He swears me in, and then he says to me, Aquilina, the only thing that would have been better is if you were black. Because I was the only minority they had. So you made him uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> well, it worked, and you did put in 20. I did put in 20, and I won so many cases and kept in so many people that, uh, at one particular camp. Uh, where I saved a lot of careers um, because they had done sloppy work and I had done my homework and I cross-examined a lot of commanders and they were shaking and turning red and basically it was entertaining for me to watch under cross-examination, which is a lot of fun, as you know. And uh, I walked out of the building and one of the commanders was walking around in circles and said, Aquilina, you're a Barracuda. And the name stuck. So I became the Barracuda. Yeah, but at least in uniform. That's right. And, and, you know, I have to say, though, in regard to the military, I love the military. I know there's problems. There's problems everywhere. But I always felt that when I was in that uniform, I wasn't a woman. I wasn't a man. I was simply a human being who was part of a finely tuned machine. And that is such a unique feeling as a woman. It's really the only time I felt that I wasn't wearing a label other than my rank. Yeah, that levels the playing field, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's an incredible feeling, very powerful. You said you write. When do you write these books? Are you a binge writer? Do you write a little at a time? I like to write something every day. Uh, it's my self-care. I think that if you don't do self-care, you self-implode. So I write, I paint, I cook, I, I do lots of things. But 
I write and, and it gets stress out. I, we talked about bullying on the bench. I've been bullied enough where I have thought, I'm going to kill somebody, you know? We've all had those moments. So that's how All Rise was born. I was mad at the chief judge, and I sat down and, and wrote it. And, of course, it's about a judge who uh, is bullied on the bench and says, I'd rather be a hairdresser. So she runs off. She becomes a hairdresser, opens a salon and coffee shop because I love coffee. She wears cowboy boots like me and all of that. And as she's opening her salon, uh, she gets arrested for killing the chief judge because he's been murdered. And of course, everything can be solved in a hair salon. It's really a big, <laughs> yes, of course. And so it's a big romp. You know, her staff comes with her. Some of the defendants who, she, who she's rehabilitated come work there. And it's a lot of fun. But when I'm stressed out, when someone bullies me, I can create whatever fiction I want and kill them off or slap them or uplift them. And it's just a lot of fun and it de-stresses me. So I try to write every day, but especially when I'm upset, I write, I take out my frustrations, not on someone else, not on myself, but on the pages. Well, you've written three books and one on the way, and I think it's finished. Uh, Just Watch Me is in Audible. Reese Witherspoon um, talked to me about my story and said, we've got to have the story. And so uh, Hello Sunshine and Audible and, and Reese, um, we produced that last year. I um, taped it. It's only an Audible, but as of middle, hopefully by Valentine's, um, it will be out in book form because so many people have said, I want it and I want you to sign it. So, and not everybody likes Audible. They they like to read. Mm -hmm. I love Audible because I drive around, I cook, I listen to stories, I catch up on my reading, but I also am someone who likes to hold a book. So all of my books come in all forms. And Just Watch Me is totally all about you. It's about me. It's it's about some of the things we've talked about, how I grew up, why, why I've done the things I've done, some of the stories uh, of cases that I've done and what I've learned. Uh, like asking, you know, what would you like me to know? How can I help? Instead of that awful why question, you know, why needs to be retired in science? Why were you wearing that? Why were you there? Uh, why did you drink so much? Why didn't you make your bed? Why didn't you do your homework? That shames and blames, right? When I ask you a why question, you want to run away. Give me the short answer and get out of there, right? But when I say, what would you like me to know and how can I help? You tell me what you're feeling. And I talk about those kinds of things and how I learned those lessons. Is it going to become a biopic? I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Is that why Reese is involved? Um, you know, Reese was involved because after the Nasser uh, case, she just really wanted to know how I knew to do what I did and said, there's a story there and you have to write it. And I said, aren't I too young to, I have a lot more to do. And she said, no, you, you need to tell this. 